everyone for attending our virtual meeting. I hope everyone's staying safe out there with this COVID virus time. At this time, I'll call the meeting to order. I'd like to introduce Sharon Bonney from COABE, who will be the first to speak. Hi, everybody. It's such a pleasure to be with you. It's amazing to be able to connect virtually like this, isn't it? Yeah. So exciting. So we've been doing a lot of this. We've been um, zooming into meetings for our state associations and I look at it as a real pleasure and just a time to sort of share what's new at COE, but also to hear from you what your concerns are or ways that we can better serve you. So I just want to put that up front that I really hope as I go through a couple slides here that you can let me know if COE is serving you in the best way possible or if you have ideas for how we can provide more benefits or more support or more leadership at the national level. So I have a few slides here to share with you. Um, is it possible, Jennifer, to be able to share a couple slides? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Um, there we go. And I'm going to warn you all, this is a new, uh, a new computer for me, so it's a new operating device, but hopefully you can see that. Can you see that? Okay, great. So I think all of you know that really our goal, our mission is to inspire educators so adults succeed and communities thrive. And we're always pushing against that and trying to find more ways to provide better leadership, more professional development, greater advocacy, and more communication. We finished up our strategic planning process, and I'm not sure if you all had seen the results from that, but what really rose to the top is that the field sees us as that voice for adult education and that they really want the advocacy work to continue. I mean, this came out like as by far even more than our national conference, which sort of surprised us. Um, and I think it's because a lot of people feel there's such a need for funding, right? And that they feel like maybe they don't have that voice at the table and that COIB can help with that. Um, so we've done a number of different things. We have in, increased the benefits that we offer to state associations. And one of them that I wanna just highlight today is this advocacy plugin and build out. And what that is, is it enables you at the state level to be able to contact your legislators without having to scroll through a whole bunch of, in the past, it was set up in such a way so that if you wanted to, to do advocacy at the state level, you kind of had to scroll through a bunch of other state associations, um, different uh, well, there's my dog. hands that they were working on. But this really is a way so that you don't have to do that. So I want to mention that only because there's another piece that this ties in with. But as well, we also have this Directors and Officers Liability Insurance, extremely inexpensive. It's, it comes out typically to about a third of what associations would pay otherwise. So that might be of interest to you. And COIB does not receive anything for this. There's no kickback, there's no incentive. It's not anything other than just trying to think of ways that we can support state associations. Um, I think you're also aware we've streamlined our awards and nominations process. And our goal really is that when you have a state level winner that you'll push them forward to the national level for consideration. And we give out um, $50,000 of awards, incentive grants, and scholarships each year. So just want to really encourage you that if you do have a state level awards process, please feel free to tap on us and push those winners forward to our national process. We also, um, many of our state associations are moving to a virtual conference platform. And I'm really excited to share that we worked with a vendor to be able to get an extremely discounted conference package together for state associations. So if you're interested in that, I'm happy to share that information with you as well. Um, I'll tell you our national state or our national virtual conference, uh, the first four years we did it, or I think first three years we did it, it was $62,000 that we had, we got it for free through McGraw Hill. When McGraw Hill sort of pulled out of the adult ed space, um, we went looking for a vendor that could support it, and they came in, the company we used was called an expo. They came in at 28,000, which is still quite expensive, I think. This vendor is coming at 9,000. So just so you're aware, that's, I'm happy to share information with you if that's something you guys are interested in. Um, but again, we get nothing for this. There's no kickback or incentive. It is truly just to support state associations. Also with membership support, we hear often that um, this is really an area where state associations as being run by volunteers who have full-time day jobs, and especially even more busier even late, lately because of COVID-19, that this might be an area that's lacking. This is something that we can provide you with support as well um, in terms of just sending out e-blasts on your behalf. Um, that's something that once we have your list, we can help you with that. There is no charge for that. So I just wanted to mention that as long as we have a good list, we can work from that. 
And then we also still do have the offer on the table that we provide website support, $500 for initial build out and then $50 per hour thereafter, which we think is really inexpensive because comparatively to other providers, it's much more. Um, I wanted to mention that our advocacy, we've really tried, tried to take that to the next level. So we have Ignite software for outreach to governors and state legislators. We have an adv advocacy campaign link for your website that we can provide. We provide uh, reports detailing impact and reach of your state efforts. And then we also have the state and national fact sheets. Um, we felt like this was really important to do, especially because of our advocacy April. And I wanted to just take a minute here to ask, has anybody here participated in our advocacy April? If you have, would you raise your hand or let me know? The reason why I asked this is because you may be aware we've, we have three major asks on the table. We have the, the usual, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Funding, 692 million, which then if we were to get that, there's no pass through the co-aid. This goes directly to the state directors down to the local programs to help keep the more than 2000 programs open. So your state legislator is supposed to match that at 40% match, right? So depending on how much we get, that's how much we can then, it then trickles down to the state level. We also have this $1 billion COVID funding request. As much as I wish that we would be able to get all that funding, I don't see that happening. I think this is more of, um, you know, maybe we'll get 300 million instead or 400 million, but we, we're shooting high, but the goal is to bring in as much as we can for the field. And again, this goes straight to your state directors down in funding for you all to deal with not, students not having laptops they need, not having Wi-Fi access, teachers being asked to, to uh, work more hours and therefore, you know, maybe need more pay or maybe you need more assistance. So that's what that funding really is for, is how to deal with COVID. And then, as you all know, there is the uh, $31 billion emergency education relief and $3 billion of that was pushed down to the CARES Act to governors. Adult education is not written in there at all. It's not, it's not even mentioned. We're concerned about that. I actually have a meeting with Assistant Secretary Stump um, and wrote a letter to Betsy DeVos, the Secretary of Education, about this and said, why, you know, why is adult education being left out when we're such a critical part of this economy? So just so you're, we're, we're working it on our, our end, but we also set up these three asks and we're asking everybody to go in and take action. So I'm hoping that at there at this, you know, in Indiana that y'all are taking action. It's really easy to do so. I don't know if any of you attended the webinar that we had um, on Advocacy April. Did anybody attend that? Okay. On that webinar, we talked about how you can meet with your legislator and it's a great time to do so. They want to hear from you. They're very interested in what is happening. They're very understanding too that it's from your home, the comfort of your home. It almost seems to make it even more impactful if it is so. <coughs> Excuse me. You can bring adult learners with you. They can dial in from their home. We have examples ranging from Alaska to California to Arizona to Ohio, all over the country, Maine, where they did this. State associations did this. They worked together as a team to pull together, say an administrator, a teacher, an adult learner, the state association president, and met with their legislator virtually just like this. And it was extremely successful. So I want to tell you that we are not without resources. There's wonderful resources. Um, if you think it'd be helpful, Jennifer, I could even kind of quickly go through with them what the resources are. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen just for a minute because I want to take you to our COAG website and to show you what we have there. Um, give me just one second, folks. I'm gonna pull this up. And I'm gonna share my screen real quickly. Okay, so hopefully you all can see that. We have here, there's of course our asks, right? To take action for federal relief. When we go here to the legislative site, those same asks are right there. Super easy to do. And really, I cannot tell you how impactful this is because I hear from legislators all the time, this makes a difference. So I'm gonna fill one out just to show you quickly Okay, when I, and I was demonstrating this for California, so if I was to, and they, they're now using it. So if I was to put in it, you know, Indianapolis, Indiana, right? And change this so it's for Indiana. And I don't know, what would be a zip code there in Indiana, Jennifer? I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Uh, 47711 is mine. 47711, okay, great. 
Now, what you're going to see here, it will actually pull all the legislators at the federal level for this, including President Trump and Vice President Mike Pence. I know this works because I get emails back from them, and so, as well as senators and representatives. Now, up here is your subject line, right? This is editable. All of this is editable. So you can change it if you wanted to. Here's an editable text in here. Again, you can put in your own fact sheets if you so desire. And then the closing, once again, editable, and you would hit submit. I'm not going to because I'm not from Indiana, but if you did, you would see um, that you would immediately, it, it would show you that you had submitted it, and then you could expect to receive some sort of response from them. So there's that one, but that's just one of those three. Like I mentioned, there's others here. There's the take action at the state level. And this is, again, there's $31 billion that's been pushed down and $3 billion for the, through the CARES Act. So once again, just so you could see, now here we go, governors, lieutenant governors, your state legislators, your state attorney general, all of this is editable. It's a little bit of a different message. And hit submit. It takes no time at all, right? But it really does make a difference. And then here's our last one, take action with 692 million. Once again, all this is editable. Here you can see all the folks we've pulled in here and hit submit. So I could tell you that the last time we really tried to activate the field, we staved off $200 million of funding cuts and added 75 million for the field overall. So it's definitely something that's within our reach. But this is just one part of it. I really wanna encourage you that the, our Capitol Hill Day is super important. We moved it to an advocacy month because we really felt like right now, this is the time, this is where we really want people to be engaged with their legislators. There's all sorts of really easy to use tools on here. For example, there's a master guide. Hopefully you guys can see this. Can you see this, Jennifer, that went, okay, great. Okay, so here we, we kind of give specifics about what we're asking people to do, what our facts are, you know, for instance, across the nation, what the 1.5 million adult learners, this really gives us a snapshot of who they are. Homeless and runaways, single parents, migrant farm workers, long-term unemployed, those who have not been employed for 26 weeks or more. English language learners, low-income adults, ex-offenders, exhausting TANF, and learning disabled. This is based on NRS. This is what we got directly from Octe. Okay, so there's all this information in here across the nation, nation, but then there's ways to look up your legislator. Super easy. You can click in here and you can type in your zip code and look up your legislator and send them an email directly that way. Or you can send an email this way, schedule an appointment with your legislator right here. Again, very, very easy. We made it as easy as possible for you so that you can, all you have to do is come down in here and insert your time, the time you'd like to meet with them, date and time. So just, again, you can change all of this. You can add in specifics that you want included, but this is you know, basically what we put together just to make it really easy. We also have state fact sheets. We took the time to work directly with Octay on this. Um, so I'm gonna go down to Indiana and so you can see this. Um, we, and I should also just a shout out to, um, we worked with a gro group of local program administrators to make this as simple and easy to use as possible. So here is the federal funding amount per adult learner. And why this to me is so bothersome is elementary ed, they receive $10,000 per pupil. We receive 369 in federal funds per pupil. And we work with those that are the hardest to reach, right? And have the most barriers to employment. This again is based on NRS data that Octay provided to us. This is um, 4,989 with high school credentials, 11,000 moving up one skill level. And you see all this data here as well. Working age adults without their high school diploma and unemployed, those in correction. So our goal really was make this as easy as possible for local program administrators to explain to their legislators. Okay, so here's that. That is right on our Educate and Elevate site, but you don't even have to worry about that. Oh, it's right here. You click on the link, download your state fact sheets. You can include program fact sheets if you want to. In fact, we have a number of state associations that did just that thing, had ours and included their own as well. And then here's our national data. We worked with the National Association for State Directors of Adult Education, a very close partner to COAID, to come up with this. So this just talks about at the national level as well. And all of that, again, is right here in this master guide that we created, which originally was for the April 8th, but now we've made it an advocacy month. 
So I'm really hopeful that this is useful to you because it really is a wonderful time for state associations to take advantage of this opportunity to reach their legislators. We also have this, this tool where you can log your appointments and let us know when you've set up an appointment. Really, really easy to use. I'm gonna type my name in here. When I hit proceed, it's gonna bring up my legislators right here. I personally set up meetings with all these folks. I'm gonna click one and just say, so you can see real quick. It asks me when the appointment date is for, the meeting time, who I'm meeting with, the location, and the member attending. And then you hit proceed and it just saves it. So then we have a log, okay, how many people actually took advantage of Advocacy April and reached out to the legislators? So as you can see, our goal really was to make this as easy as possible for our members. There's a lot of other ways here, you know, it talks about sample scheduling emails, just all kinds of wonderful information that we've been using for years. And when Michelle Davis from your um, state association came with us a couple years back, she actually was a part of those folks who went to the Hill and met in person. And that was really helpful. Um, and now, as you know, we had to move this to a virtual setting just because of COVID. We intentionally did so. Originally, we were gonna be meeting in person, bringing over 400 people from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore. So now we said, okay, we can't do that, obviously, but this is a great way to kind of make lemonade out of lemons. Um, so I bring all that up to say all of this is here. When you click on our coeb.org website, you'll immediately see the banner that comes up, Advocacy April. That's where all this is. We even have a short tutorial here. I think it's not even 10 minutes long if you wanted to go through that. There's archives from the previous webinars we've done. There's a really nice video that um, we put together with Success Files with Rob Lowe that went out to 143 million viewers. You can share that as well. So just a lot of tools for you. And I just really want to encourage you that I hope your state association will take action um, for adult education. So that's just one part of it. I know I've been um, talking quite a while about advocacy. I did mention that the field really sees this as a need. So we've been trying to encourage our state associations to do that. Um, this year, we are not gonna be conducting a virtual conference. This was a decision that we made as a group, as a board, because we really feel a lot of our state associations will, and we do not wanna compete with you. We wanna support you as much as we can. So we will not be holding a virtual conference. Um, what we did do though, is if your state has already paid the fee to it, uh, for the state association to attend that, we can just put that towards the Ignite package at the state level if you're interested in that, where we would be able to help you to do state level advocacy as well. So I'm happy to talk with your leadership about that after, but wanted to mention that as well, that we will not do a virtual conference this year. We'll support you in any way that we can for yours. Um, also, regional institutes. I think you know we have $10,000 of funding. It's still available. If you're interested, you can apply. Um, and we, we have given out over, well over $200,000 in funding to state associations to conduct regional institutes. You can conduct a regional institute alongside of your state conference as well. And that would be really exciting. We'd be happy to support that. I believe you guys already have a Google Bootcamp set up. Um, I just want to mention here again, there's more money on the table. We offer $1,000 uh, each month for winners. So what we ask is that after the Google Bootcamp, People would go in and submit success stories. We look those over. We talk with our Google representative and pull a winner each month and give that winner $1,000. It could be used for anything. It does not have to be used for teacher products or anything like that. It can be used for anything you want. It's, it's for whoever gets that money. Um, lately, we've been conducting a ton of webinars. I'm very curious if any of you have participated. Um, most of our webinars have had over a thousand people sign up. Now, typically only 67% will attend in person. Many of them will watch it after the fact if they couldn't attend live. Um, but these, we've been trying to provide COVID resources to members, but we've also been trying to continue to keep up our research to practice, um, which is this month we're doing IET, exploring IETs. Um, and we have some really fabulous presenters on there. So I just mentioned, because these are free. Here again, no charge to you. We work with vendors to get the funding so that it's free to our members. We also, of course, as you know, we have our award-winning Adult Learner Ambassador Initiative. And if Indiana has not participated, I just want to really encourage you to do so because here again, it's helping to make adult learners into uh, public speakers, being able to speak out for themselves and about the value of adult education in their own lives. Um, and one more thing before I go further, we also offer free membership for adult learners. 
our goal really is when you say, when we say there's a 1.5 million learners out there and there's only 65,000 teachers and administrators, you can see how you can really amplify the voice of adult education by bringing those adult learners on board. So many of them have beautiful stories about how adult education has changed their life. That is why we have a free adult learner membership option. We really want to amplify their voice and give them visibility with legislators and funders. And in closing, we have a number of wonderful workforce partnerships between the Marriott, the Chamber of Commerce, Amazon, um, SkillsUSA, Google, and Tyson Foods. I think the one I want to just highlight quickly is Amazon. Um, I'm not sure if anybody there has been using this, but this is a wonderful way to get a, a free field trip out to Amazon so your students can see if that's something they're interested in doing. And what Amazon is interested in is really having adult education be that pipeline for them. So in other words, as your adult learners are, you know, getting their credentials or they're passing their tests or whatnot, that they would be able to then get a job right away at Amazon if they're interested in doing so. And they provide the college and career choice where they will pay for their, their college education, they'll get them benefits, a number of wonder, wonderful things like that. We are continuing to work at that partnership, just so you know, we wanna to continue to make it better, but those, that's the one uh, workforce partnership I wanted to highlight. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Jennifer, I don't know how you wanted to, to end this, but I cannot hear you. We were taking questions by chat. Okay. Um, so let me double check and see if anyone has any questions for you. Would you like me to check in chat as well? Sure. I okay. don't see anything. Oh, and it looks like so Marilyn is saying Indiana. Oh, yeah. There's a comment for you. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Marilyn, that's wonderful to hear. Thank you. Okay, so a gentleman. Okay, there is a question, yes. Um, can you describe the partnership with Marriott? Marriott. So with Marriott, we have been working with them a few ways. One is that they have decided to become on board as official sponsor of CoAve, so that's been helpful. We're gonna be doing a video as a result of that, specifically on um, the student ambassador program and the value of working with adult learners. We've also been trying to work with them in terms of their uh, workforce feeding into our adult learning sites. That's been something that's been harder to do, to be honest with you, and especially now in this, this climate, but that's something we've been working on with them. Awesome. How do we set up our students as members? That's a great question. It's really easy. If you go to the COI website and you click on the um, membership tab and then the students, you can actually send us a list. That's really, really easy to do so. We don't even ask that they go in individually. You can send us a list if you'd like to do so. And we've had a number of programs do just that. So like one of our programs out in Florida, they have over 3,000 adult learners. They did ask the adult learners. They didn't just send us a list. They asked them. And I want to say of those 3,000, like 400 joined. So I think once they realize the benefit of it, they do so. But uh, that's how we've done it so far. Okay. Um, the question about... Can you also describe what the Amazon field trip looks like? I've tried to connect with Amazon and have not been successful. Thank you, Michelle. So that's good to know. And that's why I've said that we're working on this partnership with Amazon because they actually ended up going out and hiring somebody because we had such a um, response from the field. We had, there was so many programs that responded and we'd asked every program, okay, so how many students are we, does this, you know, mean? It was over 91,000 adult learners. It was huge. So there is a huge need there. So they've hired someone on, and I say that because I'm meeting with him actually on Thursday. So if this is a concern, Michelle, I'll definitely bring to him and let him know that you've had, you've had issues. And we did a survey recently, and we did hear from some members they had issues. We heard from other members they didn't, that they were able to get right in, have the field trip. Other members even said they you know, had one of their adult learners was hired in and that sort of thing. So I think it depends. And I think it's also been because of originally they, they just didn't have the full capacity they needed. <clears throat> you see the next one? Oh, yes. Yeah. So we do have a face-to-face -face national conference. And I apologize, I didn't have a slide in there for that. We will be holding our conference April, or I'm sorry, not April, August 16th through the 19th. Same place, Baltimore, Maryland. We're really, you know, hoping and praying, fingers crossed, that, um, you know, all the bans will be lifted. So far, we've had three people that have canceled, and 
55 people who've rolled over to the following year, but we have over 1800 that are still scheduled to attend. So we feel like that's really promising. We've had three vendors that canceled and two more that came on. So, you know, I think we're down one vendor so far. Our goal is really to just proceed. We feel like the field really needs this professional development. This is what we've heard by and large from people is they're really just hopeful it will go forward. So that's our goal is we're going to continue in, unless we can't, you know, but we'll let you know. We have a meeting today. Our executive committee does at noon. We're going to talk about this as well. But so far, it looks really good. It looks promising. As long as the bands are lifted, we'll be there. So are the COA virtual conferences available for participation on demand? They sure are. Yes, uh, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And are there vendor spots still available for co -aid? There sure is. Yes. <laughs> we have awesome. one. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I think that's all the questions. Okay. Thank you, everybody, so much. I truly appreciate your time. And just know we're here as a resource. We want to help in any way that we can. We love our state associations. You all are part of the reason we grew from 1,300 members to more than 26,000 members now. So we are really wanting to support you in any way that we can. Thank you, Sharon, for joining us. We You're do so appreciate welcome. it. You're so welcome, Ted. At, right. this time, at this time, I'll turn the meeting to Sheila Butler for the 2019 minutes. Okay. Um, Can you see my screen? No. Okay. Um, Sharon, I think I need you to stop sharing. Jen is getting that up. If you've not read the minutes, um, there are there is a link at the very top of the chat box that we put a download there. There also were mailed out to you on Wednesday in a blog, April twenty second, and um, and then there's also a link um, there. So I need to have someone in chat make a motion to approve the minutes or make corrections. Motion to approve Laura Pastori. And if you could uh, actually write that in to into the chat, that would be helpful. You don't have to say it out loud. There's a motion by Danielle uh, Shreve and a motion by Laura and a motion by John Eichelberg. So and then a second. Okay, we got some seconds there. Yeah. And then um, Jen will put up a um, a thing so everybody can vote uh, to approve. Oh. Yes. Oops. The poll is active. Seventy one, seventy five percent, seventy eight. Almost there. You've got 25 seconds. 80%. I believe we have quorum, so ending polling. Ninety-four percent approved and six percent abstained. All right, thank you. Um, next. At this time, we will turn, a, uh, turn it over to Lisa Cruy for the Treasurer's Report. Morning, everyone. Uh, we have two accounts. In our checking account, we have $65,848.37. In our savings account, we have $5,031.65 for a total of $70,880.02. So could I get a motion to approve the report as read? Polly Redman, motion to approve. Second by Karen Jenkins. Oops, wrong one, sorry about that. And poll is active. And 
and we are at 79%, 81%. We have quorum, ending polling, sharing results. Ninety-two percent have approved it. Three, uh, four abstained. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lisa. Next will be Rob Moore with the Advocacy Committee report. Okay. Uh, I'd like to celebrate some successes that we've had uh, in advocacy on behalf of our members and our students. Uh, we had a legislative session, usually. I get really nervous around the General Assembly time because uh, we're usually on defense, but this year we were actually on offense. Uh, thanks to uh, leadership of our committee members, Laura Pastore and Natalie Ruder, we actually moved some legislation that got passed with the help of our lobbyist, Joe Loftus, uh, and it was Senate Bill 398. Uh, it passed in the General Assembly, it was signed into law, and what that does was it, it, it uh, creates a pilot program for three school districts in Indiana to partner with their local adult education programs to serve seniors at high school who are mathematically way behind in credits to earn the high school equivalency and fulfill uh, requirements, graduation pathways, and a couple other things. And then they would be removed, if they do those things, then they would be removed from the uh, graduation cohort so they would not be counted as a dropout. I said that right, correct, Laura? Okay. Uh, so it's going to start with three school districts that are written into that law, uh, Washington Township, Warren Township, and Richmond. And uh, hopefully we will, they can, uh, I know they can pave the way for us and uh, show us what we can do with that. And then uh, hopefully open that up to other school districts in future versions of that law in future General Assemblies. So we think this is a our, our General Assembly has been looking for different options to help people finish high school and be employable. And uh, this is a great way that we can contribute our efforts to that uh, because they are looking for innovative ways. And we want to certainly be part of that. Uh, as I mentioned before, we do have a lobbyist, uh, Joe, Loftus, Joe Loftus from Barnes and Thornburg. You see his picture there. Uh, and We've been working with him for the last couple years. We do use our membership fees that you pay to help uh, support that because that is financially, it uh, is a bill every month for him to represent us during the months of the General Assembly. He does help us kind of outside the General Assembly months before and after also, but officially we pay him month by month, uh, Barnes and Thornburg during the General Assembly months. And we think that's a really good investment of our membership fees so that we have representation General Assembly to get to the folks that we simply cannot get to as effectively as he can. And it's really been proven very effective over the last several years we've, we've worked with him. Uh, we've also done a uh, advocacy podcast. You'll see the uh, link there. So if you uh, go to that, you'll hear a couple of us, uh, myself and Laura and, and Jennifer, talk about our advocacy efforts and what we can do uh, in the future. We really appreciate the uh, members' involvement in uh, getting legislators to their programs and other local champions so that they can meet students and be part of things like classes. They can be part of things like award ceremonies and graduation events. That's all really good uh, advocacy apart from when we have a crisis and we need letters written and people to go to the state house and phone calls made in a hurry. This is, these are things we need to keep doing, keep doing, keep doing, keep doing, keep doing in the off season, just as a regular part of business in our local programs. Uh, we will also be uh, asking you if you could uh, go ahead and uh, since we're doing remote learning to uh, post some examples of remote learning and the way that we're reaching students through distance education as an advocacy effort that shows our legislators and our community partners that we are not shut down for business. We are still in the business of delivering adult education services just in a new way that meets the new needs. So if you could post examples on your social media, make sure your lo legislators, local champions know that. Use the hashtag pound IAACE so we can send those statewide. Uh, something else that's come out very recently is PIAC data. Uh, that is a uh, periodic uh, 
assessment of literacy levels of citizens and it's an international survey. It takes several countries every year to do that. Uh, PIAC stands for Program for the International Assessment of Adult Competencies. That has been released, uh, the data, and the United States was the last release with some other countries and it's really, really neat. I've been studying that for us, for us to try to learn how to make that usable for us. We uh, will get that out to you and you can actually drill down into your county rates of literacy and numeracy at various levels and what those levels mean and uh, how we can use that in our favor for grant writing and for telling our story, you know, why we're doing what we're doing and why it's important in our various counties. So you'd be looking for that. We're kind of like letting ourselves kind of get settled into remote learning first because I am probably doing some remote registration. So we'll try to get this out to you in a, in a timely fashion. Uh, so uh, also as, as uh, I was certainly gonna, we're gonna send out uh, the COABE advocacy three asks to you and ask that you do take action on those, especially at the federal level. Uh, at the state level, as Marilyn indicated in the chat recent, uh, earlier while Sharon was talking, uh, the, one of the asks is at the state level for getting some uh, piece of the state uh, CARES Act monies. We think that uh, a lot of that, of course, will go to the K-12 education uh, providers, but we, uh, they, the group that is looking at that in the state of Indiana does have information about how we would use that adult education, particularly for expanding uh, access to distance education and learning activities in adult education. Because we know in many of our areas that's a barrier because of geography of the place or our, our uh, students, you know, uh, their technology uh, possessions and, and the, uh, equipment that they have. So we're hoping that we will be able to expand that in this current crisis and then of course afterwards. Uh, so that, that ask uh, has been made, but it's still an important priority for us statewide. So at this time, I'll entertain any questions that you have or anything that I left out. Rob will handle all questions at the end in general member comment. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you, Rob. At this time, we will turn over to Connie McCollum for the Adult Learner Committee. Good morning. So we are a new committee. Um, we are looking for members just to let everyone know, and we would appreciate uh, anyone's effort to help us. So we looked at, um, we established that our objective is to look at ways to increase learner involvement in IAACE. And we've actually collected information and about COABE's adult education ambassador training program. It looks very promising and it looks like something that as a state we definitely need to be interested in. <clears throat> and we also discussed ways to engage learners in advocacy and create representational leaders. Um, because that is very important for them and, and, and those skills will develop into bigger skills as they move forward in their careers. And then we also brainstormed about how to connect the student ambassadors that we choose uh, throughout the state. So we're, like I said, we're brand new. We just got started and we would really appreciate um, other people getting involved with us. So that's about all we've, we, we have for now on this committee. Thank you, Connie. You're welcome. Okay, at this time we have Bob Stevenson for the Literacy Committee. Or, oops, I, sorry, I forgot Laura. Sorry, Laura. We have the Adult Committee Report with Laura Pastor. Hi, everyone. Um, this is the new committee as well. And the Audit Committee is really just an extra size. Laura, your your mic uh, was a little funky there, so you might want to repeat stuff. Okay, I will try it again. Thank you. Um, I do have a, a screen that my system resources may affect my audio quality, so I'm not sure. Um, 
provide oversight for all the financial operations within IAACE. So that's where we're at. And uh, we'll just keep you guys updated on what the audit committee finds over the course of the year and our first year out there. Go ahead and please put your comments in for Laura and she will address the in general member at the end. Thank you, Laura. Next, we have the Literacy Committee report with Bob Stevenson. I do not see Bob on, so I will go ahead and do that for him. The men, I'll just remind everyone that the Memorandum of Understanding that allows IAACE members and ILA members to work collaboratively together is in effect. So if you're a member of IAACE, you are also a member of ILA and vice versa, which I think the majority of the memberships, the memorandum has been in long enough. We are also recruiting ILA board members to help plan the next steps in regards to the memorandum of understanding, which can be in regards to the budget and scholarships. So if you are interested in joining the ILA Board of Directors, we encourage you to send myself an email or Bob Stevenson. Uh, also on the board is Michelle Davis and Ted Pearson and Cynthia Warner Lowe. So you can make those contacts directly on the IAACE page. Back to you, Ted. Thank you, Jan. Next, we have the Communications Committee report with Caroline Foster. Hi everyone, sorry about the delay there. Um, yes, a couple of things to report on our communication committee. Uh, we this year have implemented a blog, a monthly newsletter. Uh, just a reminder, we do have website help page. We also have e-newsletters that are archived so you can go back. You can also see the link that has our calendar and video. We also have a podcast, as Rob mentioned. And just another reminder, as Rob also mentioned, is to keep using our different social media outlets. This does matter and it does help us in showing the difference that all of you guys are making. Currently on Instagram, we have 139 followers. On Twitter, we have 634. So that is actually our largest. And on Facebook, we have 426 followers. So when you guys are back at, you know, business as usual, or even now, if you are posting things about student success, um, keeping to go ahead and using those hashtags and making sure that IAACE is part of your post is going to really help us um, to make sure that we are connected and we're getting more followers and making sure that we are con keeping connected with you as well. That's really all I got. I hope everyone's healthy and safe. Thank you, Caroline. Next, we have the conference committee with Laura Smart. Thank you, Ted. Uh, hi, everybody. Well, um, due to a lot of different planning, we've had to uh, make some different changes, of course, with the conference, but conference must go on. Um, we are happy to announce that we have been working with um, Michael from Pathable, and we are going to be able to offer a virtual ticket uh, for $90. Now there was a survey that was sent out uh, regarding um, how many of you wanted um, uh, the face-to-face -face or a virtual. We got um, a little bit of both. I don't know, Jen, do you want to pull, do you have that information up or? No, okay. I think roughly it was 122 wanted virtual and 104 um, said no. And then um, 91, I believe it was, uh, didn't care. And 135 went in face to face. So we're kind of, you know, we're in the process of even um, considering offering a face to face and a virtual conference at the same time, which I think, you know, not everybody likes to attend conferences different ways. Um, so, Basically, that's what I have. Um, I would like to um, thank our committee conference committee, um, Dan Devers, 
uh, Dave Miller, Dave, Deb Sherwood, and Karen Yancey, Kevin Hunter, Marla Cook, Michael Tomlinson, Ed Pearson, Lisa Cruley, Sheila Butler, Michelle Davis, Connie McCollum, Caroline Foster, Cynthia Lowe, Karen Crawford, Rob Moore, Natalie Reuter, Laura Pastore, and Bob Stevenson. We couldn't do it without, without you know, a lot of help. It takes a lot to put these conferences on. Um, so again, we're still planning. So if you have any questions, please let us know. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Laura. Appreciate your input. Next, we have Employer Engagement Committee report with Michelle Davis. Hi, sorry about that. Okay. Um, first of all, I just wanna thank our committee members who have helped a lot. Um, and although this Employer Engagement Committee has kind of been hit and miss as we've done this throughout the year, and it's really been pretty much non-existent since we've been um, shelter in place at home. So, um, I just wanted to share a few tips that we went over with on how to start your employer engagement. Um, it's an important piece in adult education and I believe when we come out of this COVID-19 that it's going to look a little different, probably a lot different than how it has looked um, in the past couple of years, what your partnerships have looked like. Um, but to get going on some partnerships, I'm not gonna read these to you, you can read them yourself. Um, I will tell you with my experience in the past month of being home here and working from home that a lot of my employers that I already have built partnerships have reached out just making sure um, to see what, I, what Central Nine can offer, what Adult Ed can offer to their current employees who are now not working um, on unemployment and then what it might look like um, for them to find them employees or prospective employees when they come back and things open back up. So it's been some interesting conversations I've had. So I would just tell you, um, be open and be willing to be flexible with these employers. Um, and the more that you're creative and work with them and talk with them to really find out what their needs are, um, I believe will go a long way long way in the future with this when things open back up um, there's going to be a lot of different unique needs that as long as you keep communication open you, we should be able to partner well with these employers so thank you thank you michelle mm -hmm. next we have membership committee report with cynthia warner low mm, nope Um, hi, it's, it's actually um, the Professional Development Committee is what's next. It, it got put in last in the middle. Um, this so, Sorry about that, Ted. Um, this is also a new committee that we started this year um, with thanks to Timmy Westfall, Sarah Gutting, Joanne Vorst, and Karen Crawford. Um, we met and we decided we wanted to start to do some professional development just for members only to give you another perk to your membership. And so um, we've, we are beginning to produce webinars and podcasts for members only. We've done a few. Currently, we have two webinars and one podcast available. Um, Rob and I did, mostly Rob, did the Grant Writing 101, and that is on the website right now. Um, Google Bootcamp that we just finished on the 22nd will be coming soon. Um, we get to share that deck. Um, the podcast that they mentioned that Rob and Laura did is on there. And then upcoming, um, Karen and Dawn and I are going to be doing a Google Classroom webinar soon, probably in the next week or so. Um, and then the webinar they mentioned about the, um, PI, I don't even remember how they said that, um, PIAAC data and the uh, webinars from presentations that we were not able to fit in our conference selection, but we still think they're very valuable. So we're going to be offering some of those as well. So tune in to the newsletter next week for a Kahoot challenge um, and also be watching for notices for new upcoming um, webinars. Thank you, Sheila. Next is a membership committee report with Cynthia Warner Lowe.
And Cynthia, you're ready. I apologize. Good morning. Okay. I hope this finds everyone in good health. If you look at the membership slide, we have a total of 555 accounts. From those 555 accounts, 493 are members. And that's 88.8%. .8%. We also have accounts with no membership, um, and that's 62, 11.2%. Those are individuals who might have been a vendor at one of our IAACB conventions or um, something else where they were doing things and just haven't come back. Um, current paying, we have 401 for a total of 81% and past due. And I want to thank Jen because I know she's been working on those past due people. They've gotten all kind of love notes and things. There's 92 of them for 18.7%. And our annual um, revenue right now is $18,045 from all of our paying students. So we're really doing good on our membership. Thank you, Cynthia. At this time, I'd like to announce new board members, effective July 1st. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the election committee for their hard work and dedication, uh, Deb Sherwood, Sarah Gutting, and Timmy Westfall. I'd like to congratulate the following, Sheila Butler, who'll be the new president-elect, Teresa Lisa Crewy will be the treasurer, Karen Crawford will be returning to the board, Connie McCollum will be returning. We have a new board member, Michael Tombleson, and then Cynthia Warner Lowe will be returning to the board. I'd also like to take this moment to thank Michelle Davis and Caroline Foster for all their dedication, hard work that they've done for our board. We will definitely miss you. Um, since Cynthia's, uh, since um, Sheila is going to be the president elect, that does leave an opening for the secretary's position, which we will fill that according to the Article 11 bylaws. Okay, at this time, do we have any old business? I don't hear any, so we'll move on. New business, and we'll be with Lisa Crewy with the 2020-21 budget. Okay, what we have budgeted now for income, we have $24,075, and that is based on 535 members, each paying $45 membership fee. Um, our conference uh, income would be 400 members times $199 uh, plus the balance of it's coming from the sponsorships for a total of $144,600. So the total revenue we're expecting is $168,675. For the expenses, um, the uh, outstanding expenses for our uh, executive director and for our lobbyist and the rest of them, um, and then the conference expenses, of course. So the total expenses would be $151,207. Therefore, we're expecting a revenue over expenses of $17,468. Thank you, Lisa. Next, um, which I hope I'm right, is the DWD essay contest. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm sorry, we got a vote on that. So we need a, um, a motion in chat, please, to approve the 2020-21 budget. I'm sorry, Ted. <laughs> I, I, I did the best I could. Um, I, uh, we have a motion by Laura Smart and a second by Robert Moore and Polly Redman and bon on Bonnie Cardwell. So I'm launching the polling. Please see your screen for the poll. Uh, 
We're at 77%. Can we get it over to 80? So close, 48 out of 61. A few more. Obviously some people are not paying attention. What do you think, Ted? <laughs> Oh, yay, we're at 80%. I'm ending polling, sharing the results. We have 90% approval. So we have quorum and it is approved. Budget passes. Thank you, Jen. Okay, sorry, Jerry. Now, the essay <laughs> contest. Well, th thank you very much, Ted. Um, while the last few weeks for all of us have been very challenging for our programs, for our families. There's been a lot of uncertainty. I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased this morning to, to bring some good news to you. And um, if we recall at last year's conference, the theme was superheroes. There's a hero in all of us. And to paraphrase a quote, not all superheroes wear capes. Some superheroes have, have teaching degrees. And behind all these students are adult education programs, administrators, and especially teachers that we'd like to recognize as, as well. Um, this is the first annual and, uh, contest. And allow me just sort of to refresh your memory about the rules. Uh, any adult education student during the program year, the contest could participate. Essays were to be written in English and represent the student's original work. And the topic was, how has adult education helped me to reach the next level of my career goal? The winners, IAACE, thank you IAACE, is offering a cash prize. We'll award a cash prize of $100 to the first place winner. Second place will receive $50 and third place will be $25. Ted has already prepared the certificates and the essays will be featured on DWD's adult education website along with a brief profile and a, a picture of, of the student winners. And on behalf of the committee and I have to give all the credit to our friends and to our colleagues, Dan and Nancy, who did all the heavy lifting. I can say this, the selection of the top three were extremely, extremely difficult. But let's begin. Let's go to the third place winner. Third place goes to Alma Guerrero. She lives in Evansville and tends the Vincennes University Adult Education Program. There, as you all know, the director is Lauren Bell. Her teachers are Gretchen Easterday and Marcia Stove. Originally from Mexico, Alma has lived in Indiana for more than 20 years. And in 2017, began studying, studying in the ELL program as part of a cohort of employees studying together in a WEI class. Due to her family and responsibilities as a restaurant manager, she had spent very little time actually studying English. She did take a break from her English studies during this last program year to work on her HSC. And she passed her HSC in Spanish on the very first try. Her teachers wrote, Amma's success with her HSC has been an inspiration, not just to her family, but to her fellow classmates and to others, to others in our community who are longing to do the same. Amma has three children, two are college educated, and the youngest is in elementary school. She is a cancer survivor. And in her essay, she, she acknowledged and gave all the thanks to her teachers. She plans to continue studying English. So congratulations. Thank you very, very much, Vincent University, for helping this wonderful student. Let's go to second place. Second place goes to Michael McCammick. 
Most of Michael's life has been spent on a rural farm working to make ends meet. Through adult education, he has learned that one of the best ways to help his siblings achieve is to be their role model and to show them his own success. Their mother, their mother left their family when they were very young, leaving their father to raise him and two younger siblings. Michael has logged nearly 275 hours in adult education classes at Area 30 Career Center in Greencastle. Laura Ellsbrock there is the, the adult education director. And while attending adult education, Michael not only earned an HSC, but also he be, uh, earned a, a certification, Certified Logistics Associate, CLA certification. And he is now, and this is really the good news, he is employed at Walmart Distribution Center in Greencastle, in Greencastle, making more than $18 an hour. Wow. Michael loves his job. He will be moving into an apartment near work in a couple of months. He is learning how to manage his money and recently purchased a dependable used truck. And in his essay, he said, one of my goals when I set out to get my HSC was to better myself as a person and to get out on my own. With this program, it's given me the ability to have a great paying job and benefits at only 19 years of age. This program has given me belief in myself, a new career, and ability to achieve the goals I have set in life. Congratulations, Michael. Thank you for a job well done. Second place. And drum roll, first place. First place goes to Katrina Dalton. Katrina is a single daughter and last fall earned an HSC through Central Nine Adult Education Center in Greenwood. And of course, Michelle Davis, who is on the call to, uh, on the webinar today is is a, the director. Katrina said in her essay, after I received my diploma, one of the career coaches reached out to me and asked if I would like to meet with her to discuss next steps. We talked about career paths, and even though I knew it was my goal to become a life coach, something about her experience in social work interest me. During my time with my career coach, she shared her personal experience not only as a career coach but as a social worker as well. She also helped me fill out an application for Ivy Tech Community College. College. College was something that I never thought would happen to me. But because help was so readily available, I decided I could keep moving forward. I was challenged and encouraged throughout the entire process. I am now on my way to something bigger. Yes, she is on her way. She is now a freshman studying human services at Ivy Tech. And she wants to help others in a way that impacts lives for the better. Now, how encouraging is that? Katrina received help from a caring staff at Central Nine, and now, and now, she wants to pay it back. By the way, I didn't mention this, by the way, her winning essay was entitled, Support Leads to Success. Support Leads to Success. Katrina, Central Nine, and the top three finishers. Actually, all of the essays were just excellent. It was a very, very difficult decision, I can tell you on behalf of the, of the selection committee. But thank you so very much, and thank you, IAACE. Thank you, Jerry. 
Next, we'll open up to general member comments and uh, questions. We do have a few uh, back to uh, comment or a question for Rob in regards to the PIAC, PIAC data. Do you want to just, it's, let's see. I think we solved it in chat, but for the record, they want to know what the PIAC stands for, Program for the International Assessment of Adult Com Competencies. And Rob did put in chat the link to the data and it will be available on the website um, later today. Our website later today. A question in regards to I believe it was I think it was addressed for professional development. Bobby Burns would like to learn how to create a virtual lesson combining video, audio, and real-time writing with a tablet. So there's an idea for a webinar. And actually, Bobby, I can probably help you with that if you want to um, set up a time to Zoom with me. Oh, question in regards to the conference in regards to the June date. Laura, do you want to address that again, making sure everyone understands? Um, I'm not seeing the comment. It's, um, it's a while back. They basically want to know if the June date is valid. Oh, yes. Um, it's okay. I just verbally said it and said chatting it. <laughs> Um, yes, June 22nd, 23rd, and 24th is definitely set, um, and it will be at, well, <laughs> we'll see, <laughs> virtual or at French Lick, or both. We are waiting basically on the government to release the uh, guidelines, everyone, just so we want to make sure that we follow the guidelines and the rules, so right. that is what we are waiting on. Searching. I do want to make correction to the uh, slides. Uh, it incorrectly noted that she, uh, Lisa, was secretary, and is she did get elected as treasurer. So we will be making a correction to that slide before we release to general membership. Congratulations and thank yous to Michelle and Caroline. Abide in the general comments. Congratulations are a lot of those congratulations to all of the award winners for the essay contest. Lots of clapping. And someone asked about when they might be able to make hotel reservations for French Lit. Do you know when that would be available? Yes, it is available now. Um, you can call and make your hotel reservations. If you go onto the conference webpage and under conference promo, there'll be a button just under the survey. All the buttons are still there for the hotel button. So you can click that button. You can make them directly uh, with a laptop or computer on your computer, or there is a 1-800 number with the code listed there. So yes, French Lick reservations are available. They are due by May 27th. Okay. And, and Matt Kreitz, oh, okay, 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 go ahead. Matt Kreitz also commented that there's resources available for distance education on the DWD website. And Rob is saying we should also mention the IAACE Executive Director Office Hours. <laughs> Rob, uh, are you talking about the virtual office hours on Zoom? Uh, yes, I guess that's what you are talking about. We do, we have been doing those all month long and we have uh, one more scheduled, which is scheduled for next week on, I believe it is for Thursday. Yes. No, Wednesday. We went to Wednesday next week for some reason. Oh, the newsletter. Uh, so next Wednesday, the 29th, uh, 1130 Eastern Standard Time, you get emails with the Zoom information. 
and then we will be doing those, uh, continuing those. Uh, it's just a matter of how often will be up to you guys. So we'll have more information in that. Just kind of FYI, the newsletter that is normally released to yesterday will be released next week uh, so that we can get all the annual meeting information in it and make sure we have all this data in there. Um, the resources on the DWDA you, that you mentioned that, correct? And he did put a link in next to that. So in regards to the conference uh, and the fees, uh, we're still working out all those details of um, how that will work if it goes all virtual or how it will work if it, you know, if someone wants to convert. So just give us a little bit more time on that, but know that IAACE will work with every program to ensure that you spend your money wisely and that we make sure that we please everyone in regards to that. So we will do our absolute best to make sure that we handle all of that with the necessary gentleness, I guess. I don't know other word, Ted, how about you? <laughs> we will make sure it's right. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I think that is everything in regards to general comment. Okay. The next would be announcements with Laura or Sheila. Um, okay, I guess I can do this. Um, as of next year, uh, mark your calendars because our conference is going to be at Blue Chip in uh, Michigan City. And uh, so we're excited about, we're just changing things up a little bit because our contract was up with French Lick. And so we're going to be moving north next year. Thank you, Laura. Do we have any motion to the adjourn the meeting or does anyone have any other comments? I would like to do something for the winners. Um, if we could um, do a bring back the screen for each of the winners, we can, and someone can, we can, several people can video it because one of us might get a good one. But we bring up the screen and then we switch it to the entire group's chat and everybody turns on their mics and applauds them. And we can do one for each of the winners and that way that they each get to hear that we really did appreciate their efforts. Um, and that way it can be attached then or sent to them if everybody's amenable to doing that. Sure. Okay, I'm going to um, watch for all unmuting of mics. You should have the ability to unmute your mic yourself. But I am helping out those if you like wave. If you go to a side by side view, uh, you can, you can, um, so let me get my camera ready. <laughs> my video and I can't clap. clap. Let's do this kind of thing. Okay, everybody be quiet for just one second. Except the background noise. Jerry, say the third place winner. Winner is Alma Guerrero from Hey, good job. Woo. Congratulations. Bring up the screen. Do it again. Do it again. Bring up the screen and do it again. <laughs> Can you bring up the screen that says her name? No. Uh, How about I go to this screen when uh, it's on for everybody? That's oh, yeah. easier. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and if you're not using your the camera, there's a little clap reactions and a little handle show up on your name. Right? 
Are you ready? All right, Jerry, say the second place name. Michael. Michael McCammick, second place. Oh, Michael. <laughs> All right. And how about first place winner, Jerry? The first place winner from Central Nine Career Center in Greenwood, Indiana is Katrina Dalton. Katrina! Katrina! Katrina. Congratulations! Congratulations, Fred! Yay! <laughs> Muting all. <laughs> um, and I think, let's see. We made the announce. If there's any other announcements, Okay. All right. Um, it looks like we have a motion to adjourn the meeting by Robert Moore and a second by John Eichelberg. If there is no objections in the chat, uh, the motion will carry. Seeing no objections. The meeting has adjourned. I want to thank everyone for attending the meeting. I want to thank for the awesome board that I got to work with this past year as president. And uh, I want everyone to stay safe. Thank have you. Have a good weekend. You too. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.